Hi, Juan Pablo. Hi, Wendy. Hi, everybody. Hello. Hello. Got a speaker, I'm too early, I think. <laughs> it's okay. Hi there. Hello. Thought I'd log in a few minutes early, test everything out. Yeah, for sure. Meg, I'll watch the um, executive director box in case there's any people that have need the, the, the meeting link. Okay, great. Hi, Matt. We haven't met, but I'm Wendy Horn. I'm the executive director. It's good to put a face with a with someone who I read on Twitter every single day. Wow, every day. <laughs> Just because I monitor what our members are tweeting about. So 
you're you're very savvy with the media. You do a fantastic job. So it's oh, nice well, to meet you. Well, thank you. It's very kind yeah. of you. Yeah. Well, nice to meet you. Morning, everybody. And John. Morning, John. <clears throat> About two minutes to go. And Meg, we're recording this so that we can offer it to people who couldn't attend due to the time zone. Great. Correct. Good morning. I guess it's good afternoon. Hey, Vlad, Matt. Sorry. Good afternoon. Hi, Jonathan. Hi. Yeah, we're right at 11, so maybe we'll give it one more minute. I think we have most people on who registered. There's a couple of additional people that just um, that asked for the link. Sure. Okay. I sent it. I'll give them a moment to join us. <laughs> Wendy, do you recall who, where they were from? We should probably go ahead and start. Okay, yeah, I agree. Okay, um, well, thank you everyone for um, coming together today um, for this uh, cannabis um, primer in US and Canada meetup. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to Jonathan Sherman, who is with Much Cellist in Chicago uh, to get us started and he'll um, introduce himself and his firm. And then we will, um, uh, after his presentation, um, go and hear about um, from Torque from the folks at Torque in Maine um, about what's going on in Canada. So, Jonathan, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks very much, Meg, and thanks to you and to Wendy for putting this together. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where everybody is. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to to have this phone call uh, and hopefully uh, learn from each other. Um, as Meg said, I'm with Much in Chicago. Um, my background is I'm a commercial lawyer. I've been practicing for uh, more than 30 years, uh, both as a trial lawyer and as a corporate lawyer. Um, we became involved at Much in the cannabis area, I would say about five to seven years ago, when several of our clients became interested in, in this, what at the time was a new field and a growing field 
and they really had uh, the vision and the entrepreneurial spirit um, to learn about the, uh, this area, to invest in the area, and it's turned out uh, quite well for them, and it's been an interesting and dynamic area of the law uh, for us and, and for my colleagues. So I'm going to put on my uh, screen share and pull up my presentation. Uh, let's see. There we go. And okay. So hopefully you can see that. Is there anybody having trouble seeing the screen? Okay. So just to begin with, uh, you know, very, very brief and, and high level um, look at um, the science of what we're talking about. Um, we're really talking about the hemp and marijuana plants today. Um, those are derived from the cannabis sativa L plant, which is um, part of the Cannabacea family. Um, depending on the THC content of the plant, that determines whether the plant is classified as either hemp or marijuana. Um, hemp having less than a 0.3% THC content um, and marijuana having greater than 15% THC. Um, THC is the chemical in the plant that um, determines whether or not it has psychoactive effects. Um, in, in common language, that's what we would say determines whether one can get high um, from using the plant. So typically, if you're talking about an intoxicating effect um, or somebody getting high, that applies to marijuana. And if you're talking about a plant that has other benefits um, but does not create a high, that would be the hemp plant. There are additionally um, CBD components in both um, hemp and marijuana. Um, CBD products do not create an intoxicating effect. They affect different receptors located throughout the human body. Um, and people have started using those uh, in the United States in various forms, uh, such as capsules, creams, um, gummies, drinks, and generally, they, uh, the, the, um, the anecdotal reports are that they can relieve uh, muscle aches, um, help people sleep better at night, uh, and have other um, wonderful effects on the body without creating the high. THC, on the other hand, affects receptors that are located in the brain and have a strong psychoactive effect. Um, under United States federal law, and our laws here are determined on both federal law on the one hand and state law on the other, um, the use of cannabis products is still illegal in the United States, other than hemp products. So uh, several decades ago, um, cannabis was, was classified as what's called a Schedule I drug under the Federal Controlled Substances Act. And what that means is that um, uh, cannabis and other Schedule I drugs are considered to have a high potential for abuse. This creates tension with the state governments because several states uh, have moved in recent years to legalize the use of cannabis products in various forms. Um, currently, um, cannabis, including uh, the products with a high THC content, have been legalized in 33 states out of 50, uh, plus the District of Columbia for medical use. And um, it's also legal in 11 states and the District of Columbia for recreational use. We included a chart here so that you could see on a state by state basis um, where medical use is permitted uh, and where recreational use is permitted. I would just caution everybody that if you have a client or if you're considering doing some work in one of these states, you, you really should double check what the current status of the law is 
because it's a, it's a fluid situation where some states um, have very recently approved um, cannabis products for recreational use. Um, and so things are changing in real time. And I would just encourage everybody to double check what the law is in the state that you're thinking about. If you have any questions about a particular state, I'd be happy to follow up for you uh, and get back to you. Um, in terms of a legal regime that governs uh, uh, the businesses that can own cannabis licenses, um, there are several different licenses. And this chart refers to the regime that's currently in place here in Illinois, which is uh, where we practice. Um, one can apply to the state for all of these different types of licenses, whether it's a dispensary, a craft grower, an infuser, transporter, or cultivation center. Um, in order to engage in one of those businesses, you have to obtain a license from the state. Uh, I won't read each line, but you can see from the description what each one of these um, different types of licensees does uh, if they obtain a license. It's important to note also that um, just because somebody was awarded in the past a license to operate a medical dispensary, that doesn't mean that they're free to sell recreational marijuana products. They have to apply for a separate and new license uh, to sell recreational, even if they have a license for medical products. Again, here in Illinois, uh, we put this in just to give you an overview of what criteria are considered by the state in determining whether or not a business will be awarded a license. Um, here in Illinois, there are a total of 250 points available in the application process. Um, applicants spend a lot of time and a lot of money with consultants um, drafting a written plan that is submitted to the state for its consideration. So uh, the different categories of information that are considered are what sorts of training are given to employees, what's the security plan, um, what's the background uh, of the owners and operators, how much knowledge do they have, what are their employment practices, um, uh, do, do any of the owners uh, have status as a veteran of the United States military? They're given credit for that. Um, and what sort of plans do they have for community engagement? You'll see at the lower left, there are 50 points available for what is called a social equity applicant. We'll talk about that separately. Um, as you may be aware, uh, for the past several decades, um, there has been a major attempt by the American government to, um, to control the use of illegal drugs. Um, some people refer to that as the war on drugs that was taking place here in, in really the 60s, 70s, 80s, and into the 90s. And that war on drugs had a disproportionate effect um, largely on minority populations in the major cities. Um, it is alleged by some that there was inappropriate police activity in which people of color and other minorities uh, were arrested at a higher rate than white people um, for uh, such offenses as um, uh, dispensing marijuana um, and even possessing small amounts of marijuana. And in many cases, people were prosecuted, they were convicted, and they were sent away to prison. Um, there were resulting economic effects on certain neighborhoods, um, where certain neighborhoods became blighted. Uh, other more um, common forms of business didn't want to have any business dealings in those neighborhoods. Those neighborhoods became blighted, as I say. Um, and there are many, many people throughout the country um, who feel that there, were, there was a great injustice done uh, to people living in these neighborhoods. Several states, including the state of Illinois, have attempted to address, to address that situation by giving certain applicants what's called social equity status. And as you can see from the slide, um, an applicant will be awarded social equity status if he or she, um, if the business is at least 51% owned and controlled 
by a resident, by somebody who resided for five or 10 years um, in a disproportionately affected area, um, somebody who was involved in ownership of the business who may have been convicted of an offense, such as possession of marijuana, that is now eligible to be expunged from that person's record, um, or a composition of employees who have that type of background or who come from that disproportionately affected area. Uh, if one can demonstrate that they meet that qualification, they will be entitled to both lower licensing fees and other forms of uh, low interest financial assistance from the state government. As an overview of the types of fees that are involved, if somebody wants to apply for a dispensary license here in Illinois, uh, this sets out um, some of the financial um, thresholds. There's a $60,000 license fee. The applicant must have at least $400,000 in liquid assets, obviously background checks on the principal officers, and then they have only 180 days to find a location. That's not a very long period of time if you're looking for a place to open a business, but they want to essentially either get these businesses up and running or move on to somebody else um, who can do so. There are a couple of pieces of legislation that I wanted to mention that, that have had a significant effect and will have a significant effect on this industry. Uh, in 2018, the United States Congress passed what is called the Farm Bill. That was the law that officially um, uh, ruled that hemp products no longer meet the classification of a controlled substance. So as a result, um, one can uh, sell hemp products across state lines. One can bring hemp products into the state from other states because there's no risk of being charged with a federal offense uh, for buying and selling hemp products. There is another important law that is currently pending before Congress called the Secure and Fair Enforcement Banking Act or the Safe Banking Act. That bill has been approved by the House of Representatives. It has not yet been taken up or approved by the Senate, so it is not yet a law. That is a very significant bill because that would make it permissible to, for banks uh, to provide loans and other services to um, uh, businesses in the cannabis field, uh, which banks are now precluded from doing. Because cannabis is a Schedule I offense and because cannabis is still illegal under federal law, the federally chartered, bank, chartered banks um, are not able to service these industries. Uh, which makes the cannabis industry largely um, a cash controlled industry here in the States. Here are some of the effects of uh, removing hemp uh, from the list of controlled substances. There are now federal trademark protections available for hemp products. Um, marijuana products, as I say, are still illegal and one cannot get federal trademark approval for marijuana products because it's a controlled substance. At the state level, it is possible to get trademarks um, for hemp products. And in those states where marijuana use has been legalized, it is possible to apply for state trademark protection. Uh, this industry has uh, an impact on many, many um, areas of the law and many um, different businesses. Uh, there are sometimes questions as what, right, uh, what are the rights of an employer um, to ask employees about whether or not they're using uh, cannabis products or hemp products or similar types of products. Uh, employers are still permitted to have a drug-free workplace. These issues should be addressed in an employee handbook, just like any other issue. And it's still permissible for um, employers to prevent employees from coming to work if they're under the influence of uh, cannabis products, just as if they were under the influence of alcohol um, or other, uh, other types of substances that might affect their job performance. 
in terms of what we see coming down uh, the pike in the future, um, there's uh, obviously um, an economic downturn in the United States right now, uh, caused primarily because uh, by the COVID situation. Um, this has cut way back on the amount of active investment in cannabis-related industries. Um, it's expected that there will um, be a demand for cannabis businesses and cannabis investment um, once the economy uh, returns to um, its previous status. Um, if uh, a significant law like the Safe Banking Act um, is enacted, it's anticipated that many conventional large companies will want to get involved in the field as well because there will no longer um, be that type of prohibition against banking use. Uh, many of the larger pharmaceutical companies are studying the use of cannabis products. It's, it's anticipated that they'll get into the field. Um, already we see um, retailers operating commonly um, patronized stores selling CBD related products. Um, whether it's lotions or um, substances that are included in, in food products, those are already happening and you see those in uh, businesses that have, have very, good, uh, very good reputations. There are a lot of ancillary businesses that would benefit from an expansion of the cannabis field, um, wellness uh, types of industries, transportation industries, tourism. Um, so there's a lot of potential if the cannabis field uh, continues to grow. Those are all the points I have for now. I've included my contact info if anybody wants to follow up and uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thanks for the opportunity and I'll turn it over to Andrew and Matt. Let me, can I ask you just a couple of questions, John? Of course. Um, for starters, thank you. That was informative and helpful. Um, I have three sort of separate questions that you know maybe you can respond to now or later. One has to do with the Safe Banking Act. Um, I know approved by the House. Um, I heard that it'll be a challenge to get it through the Senate. So I was curious, you know, what your thoughts were on the likelihood of that coming into law, you know, anytime soon. Um, that's sort of my first question. My next question has to do with the Farm Bill. Um, in the sense that um, I'm a little bit confused in the sense that when you're putting um, any of those products into food, my understanding is it had to be approved by the FDA and the FDA has been slow as far as approving infusing CBD into different food products. So I was just curious if you knew anything about that. And lastly, the trifactor is I was curious if you could tell us which states um, are expected to either um, approve medical or rec this fall, like if it's on the ballot. I know that there's certain states that are leaning that way. Um, can you comment on any of those? Well, Andrew, you're you're testing my ability to remember all three points, but I I all surreptitiously true. I surreptitiously jotted them down, so I think I can do it. Let's see. Um, in terms of the Safe Baking Act, you're exactly right. Uh, the Senate, um, as you probably we know is currently controlled by the Republican Party. Uh, Mitch McConnell is the, is the majority leader, and he is simply refusing to bring it to the floor for a vote. So while the current administration is in the White House, and while the Senate controls, um, uh, I'm sorry, while McConnell controls the Senate, it's unlikely that there will be a vote. So, so I think we're pretty safe to conclude that at least through January of next year, um, when either uh, President Trump will begin a second term or presumably Joe Biden will begin, will become the next president, there's unlikely to be any vote on the Safe Banking Act um, until at least January. Okay. Um, in terms of the Farm Bill and the interrelationship with the FDA, um, that, that's a good question. I, I, I don't have a great answer for you. I'm happy to look into it further. My understanding is that the FDA, I'm sorry, the FDA which is the Food and Drug Administration, has simply abandoned the field and they're not closely looking at CBD products. Um, I, I can tell you that anecdotally, I, I ride a bicycle and I've been in bike shops and on display, you know, at the, on the counter in a bike shop is a wide array of CBD products. 
by manufacturers who I would not have a great deal of confidence in, um, just based on the labeling and what I read on, on the packaging. Right. So it seems to be, you know, a Wild West situation situation right now where people can claim to be um, uh, manufacturing the CBD product at a high standard, but I don't think anybody's um, looking over anybody's shoulder right now. But I'm going to make a note to look at that and, and let, me, let me follow up with you on that. Sure. Um, and, and the same with respect to other states where uh, this is on the ballot. I don't have a good handle on other states where it might come into effect. Um, part of what I was suggesting when we showed the map is it is ra a rapidly changing landscape. And I know it's been talked about. Um, the use of cannabis products for medical purposes doesn't even seem to be controversial anymore. Um, I would expect that slowly that's going to become the law in, in almost all, if not every, of the, every one of the 50 states. Um, recreational use is a little bit more controversial. Um, there are many communities, even in states where um, recreational use has been legalized, there are communities that say, based on their home rule government uh, uh, powers, that they don't want a dispensary within their, within their um, community for recreational purposes. So it's a changing situation. If you have a particular spot you'd like me to look at, I'll be happy to, but I'll, I'll get back to you with places where um, recreational uses on the ballot. Okay, thanks. Sure. Over to you, Matt well, and Andrew and Vlad. Okay. Um, I'm Andrew Wilder. Um, I'm here with uh, Matt Maurer and Vlad Maheski from our office. Um, about five years ago, we started a cannabis law group. Um, it's been very successful, very busy across Canada. Um, cross-border and also internationally to a smaller degree. Um, we have um, 11 dedicated lawyers who work in this group as well as lawyers in other areas of our firm such as banking or tax um, or litigation that support um, sort of our cannabis group because it's, it's often very corporate driven. Um, and it, it, it continues to really be an exciting part of our business at this firm and, and it continues to grow year over year. Um, today, we're going to try to give you a quick overview. Um, Vlad's going to start off, tell you a little bit about the federal um, rules, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about provincial and trends, and then Matt's going to jump in to answer all the hard questions. Over to you, Vlad. Excellent. Um, just trying to pull up the PowerPoint. Thanks. Here we are. All right, thank you, Andrew. Um, so welcome everyone and uh, thank you for joining us for this presentation on the Canadian cannabis market. Uh, we will be going through the legal status of cannabis in Canada, the variety of cannabis products that are available for purchase, uh, the legal regimes that govern the various aspects of our cannabis market, and some current and future trends that we're seeing. So a brief history of cannabis legalization in Canada. Uh, as many people may know, cannabis is legal both medicinally and recreationally in Canada, both at a federal and provincial level. Medical cannabis has actually been around since 2001. Uh, when it was purely a homegrown model for patients that were prescribed cannabis for their ailments. This changed uh, to a commercial model in 2013, whereby patients could no longer grow their own cannabis and had to purchase it from licensed producers. For a number of constitutional reasons that I won't get into, uh, that regime was repealed and replaced with a hybrid legislation that allowed for both commercial production and home growth. As of October 17, 2018, the legislation was replaced once again, this time with the Cannabis Act, which is what we have now. And this added the layer of recreational cannabis um, to what was previously only a medical system. 
uh, we'll be going um, through this in further detail, uh, but the federal legislation in Canada is the Cannabis Act, which governs the production, possession, distribution, licensing for production, uh, and the sale of cannabis, particularly for medical cannabis. The provinces have their own legislation governing licensing for retail stores, the sale of recreational cannabis, public consumption, and they also have the ability to strengthen um, certain federal laws around uh, possession limits and the legal age of consumption. So the uh, population of Canada is 37 million people with about um, 28 million adults. As of 2019, four to six million individuals were um, cannabis users, which is rough, roughly 15% of our population. The recreational market has been booming with uh, sales projected uh, to be roughly 2.5 billion or 1.8 billion US by the end of 2020 this year, um, which is more than double what we did last year. This is in part due to the great expansion of retail outlets throughout our country. Uh, there are approximately 850 retail stores open across the country. Uh, however, this is going up exponentially as Ontario, our largest province, uh, was a bit slow to the game and has just under 100 stores currently. This province um, is projected to have around 1,000 stores before market saturation, so clearly still lots of room for expansion. Uh, the increase in revenue projections is even despite the drop in prices um, that have been reported, which are approximately 25% for dried cannabis, as reported by the Ontario Cannabis Store. Uh, there is a push to make cannabis cheaper in an effort to eliminate the black market, which brings us to our next slide. The Cannabis Act was legalized, um, uh, which legalized recreational cannabis was a campaign promise of our Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, uh, the purpose of which was to protect public health and safety, particularly that of youth, and eliminate the black market. Uh, this is important background to keep in mind when we get into the many restrictions imposed by the Cannabis Act and the responsibility of cannabis producers and retailers in servicing the market. Here's a slide of many of the cannabis uh, brands and companies that have emerged over the years as national and global leaders in the space. The federal government has issued licenses to almost 400 separate facilities in Canada to date. So suffice to say, there's a lot of cannabis being grown. Uh, unfortunately, however, due to some difficult times financially, uh, which Andrew will get into more, uh, some cannabis producers have overextended and are now having to downsize and sell or close some of their facilities. For example, Aurora recently announced that it plans to close five of its facilities um, while Tilray is uh, closing its Ontario greenhouse next month. And here are uh, the products that are available for production and purchase, including dried cannabis, fresh cannabis, cannabis oil, uh, seeds, plants, edibles, topicals, and concentrates, with those last three only being available for purchase since December of last year. As previously mentioned, the Cannabis Act is the federal legislation that governs, governs many aspects of the market on a national scale. It imposes a possession limit in public of 30 grams, um, although this is up to 150 grams for medical patients. The age restriction for uh, cannabis sale and consumption is 18, although this age is, uh, the age limit has been increased by many of the provinces as Andrew will discuss in a moment. 
Uh, Canadians are allowed to grow up to four plants at home and you can grow outside. However, you cannot obtain the seeds or the starting material from an illicit source. Um, therefore, it has to be purchased from a licensed retailer. And as mentioned, the Cannabis Act can be extremely restrictive, especially when it comes to protecting public health and safety, uh, as well as youth. So advertising and promotion can only be done in certain ways, usually in an age-restricted environment where young persons are not allowed. Uh, here's a picture of what typic, uh, typical cannabis packaging would look like. As you can see, there's very little opportunity for brand promotion and uh, the majority of the packaging contains warning messages. Production on a commercial scale needs to be licensed by the federal government. Here is a chart of the various licenses that came about with the Cannabis Act and what you can do with each of them. Cultivation licenses allow you to grow cannabis, while processing licenses allow for the production of derivatives, such as edibles and topicals. The cultivation and processing licenses also come in a micro version uh, that allows for production on a smaller scale, which is also less stringent um, for security requirements. While the standard licenses allow for un unlimited quantity of cannabis production. Uh, micro cultivation only allows you to grow in an area of 200 square meters and micro processing licenses only allow um, up to 600 kilograms of cannabis per year to be processed. Uh, th there are also specific licenses that can be applied, um, applied for for the sale of medical cannabis analytical testing, uh, research and development, and cannabis drug licenses. Uh, with that, I now turn it over to my colleague, Andrew, uh, who will discuss the legal regimes in the provinces and then some current and future trends. Sounds good, thanks Vlad. Um, similar to the states, as you'd expect, you know, our federal government does certain aspects, the province or the states have certain jurisdiction and then the municipalities have certain jurisdiction. This is just a nice chart that we found that gives you a little bit of an idea as to who does what. Um, and it generally makes sense. Um, I'm not going to go through many of the federal ones that Vlad just talked about. But uh, what I will point out to you are some of the things that are covered off by the provinces. And then I'm going to go through a little bit of it. So as you can see, you know, the provinces are involved in, in health. They're involved in education. Um, but they're also involved in workplace safety, uh, similar to what John talked about before. But one thing that keeps us very involved is the wholesale retail model in each province. Um, each province is a little bit different. There's certain models that I'll talk about in a minute. But this is a, a general chart that lets you understand the different levels of government that are involved depending on what you're doing. And municipalities, really, it depends from municipality to municipality how many how much influence they have um, when granting retail licenses in certain provinces you need to have municipal approval as part of your application so it slows it down in other provinces it's not required like in ontario there's no separate zoning for cannabis retail it's just retail so if you're zoned retail then you can have cannabis there um, i'm not going to dwindle really any more on this page other than just to mention um, age limit which is both federal and provincial. As Vlad said, um, in the federal act, it was set at 18 being the minimum. As it turns out, um, Alberta applies that, that law, so you have to be 18 or older. Every other province in Canada has increased it to 19 years, um, with the exception of Quebec, who at the beginning of this year um, was able to increase it to 21 years. Um, so that's, that's the age requirement across the provinces. Black, can I get you to flip to the next one? So this is a bit of a map of Canada and it, it highlights sort of three different colors. And it's just to give you an idea of how retail is different across the country. So if you look at the reddish color there, which is public retail, what that means is 
Um, in all of those jurisdictions, there's a provincial wholesaler that purchases all the cannabis from licensed producers across the country. They enter into supply agreements, they get it. And then if you wanna buy cannabis in that province, then you have to either um, buy it online from them. Um, that's actually the only way you can buy it. Sorry, you buy it online from them in, in those situations. And some of them have their own stores as well. There are, in those provinces, there are brick and mortar stores that are provincially run. Um, the next one is let's do let's do the blue because it's smaller, which is private. Um, there's really only two that that are in that model, which is Saskatchewan and Manitoba. Saskatchewan's really true private, where um, a licensed producer can sell directly to the retailer, who can sell it directly to the public, both in a bricks and mortar and online store. Manitoba slightly different. Um, there still is a wholesale provincial um, buyer, but after, after the province buys it and it sells it to the retailer, the retailer can sell it both at a bricks and mortar store or online. And then the last model, um, which really applies to many of the provinces, including Ontario, is this hybrid model, where there's a public and a private, a little similar to Manitoba, but a little bit different. So the way it works in those provinces, again, is there is a provincial uh, body that buys the cannabis and acts as the, as the wholesaler. It sells it to the retail stores and the retail stores up until recently were only able to sell it through their bricks and mortar um, stores. They had no ability to do online sales. I'll talk about that in a second. That was a monopoly that was kept to the provincial wholesalers. Uh, and in Ontario, that's the Ontario cannabis store. So if you wanted to buy it before there were these retail stores, you had to buy it online from them and the retail stores weren't able to sell it online. Um, one of the changes that has happened over the last little while, in part due to COVID, which I'll talk about in a minute, is um, it allowed retail stores in certain provinces to um, do something called click and pay. So you can go onto my website, you can find what you like, you can pay for it and it's ordered, but you have to go to the store and pick it up. Um, a couple of the changes that came, and I'll talk about it in a moment, in, as, as a result of COVID, is the past two new temporary laws that allow curbside pickup. So if you did this click and pay, you could go and there could be curbside delivery to you. And it allowed really for the first time these retailers to do home delivery, which is something that's always been reserved for the provinces. Um, why don't we flip to the next slide, Vlad? This is just some current and future trends I'm gonna go over, but I'm just gonna talk about COVID first. So, you know, as, as it was taking over the world COVID, um, as it happened in many states, uh, it certainly happened in Canada, there was a real spike in sales because people didn't know whether they'd be able to get their pot and people bought more pot and spent more money on pot initially. And there was a pretty big spike in retail sales initially. Um, what happened very quickly thereafter is uh, the government, there was, you know, in each province, there were national emergencies that required you to close everything except for essential services. And right off, right out of the gate, uh, retail was not an essential service, but there was a lobby group put together that very quickly lobbied the government and it was considered an essential service. Um, the government did allow licensed producers to be considered a uh, essential service. So that continued going along. Um, however, during the, for, during the time frame, because people were working from home because of physical distancing, you know, there were less licenses being granted in general. There were less inspections being done in general and things were being backed up. It was taking a bit more time. Um, but on the, on the flip side to that, many of the rules became a little bit more lenient and they would allow minor amendments to licenses uh, more quickly and through less uh, bureaucracy than was generally required. Um, I mentioned sort of the last point there is just this deregulation allowing for curbside pickup and home delivery. You know, that's a temporary thing, but certainly retailers are pushing hard for that to become a permanent thing. Um, just go over this quick stat because I always find stats interesting. So Canadian recreational sales totaled 181 million in March which was almost a 20% increase um, from the past month. 
And I just have, it's not on this slide, but I just saw data with respect to April. Uh, April was about 180 million, so slightly down. Um, and it was down in eight provinces, but it's, it's pretty minorly down. And the current, the current projection still on retail cannabis, or sorry, recreational cannabis in Canada is 2.6 billion, 2.16 billion. If I get you to flip flat, I just want to talk a little bit about what happened to the markets. Um, you know, as you know, it was the green rush. And uh, as soon as you had an application to become a licensed producer, uh, companies were trying very hard to go public. Many of them went public. They were crazy multiples. These companies weren't producing, weren't making any money, were losing money, but were raising money like crazy. And if you look at this chart, you can see in January 2018, which is the beginning of the first year after legalization happened, you know, there was an absolute peak uh, in public offerings and companies going public. That stayed very strong, I would say. You know, it did go down, which makes sense, but it stayed very strong until I'd say the fall of this year. Um, the fall of this year, what started to happen is many, many, many of these companies uh, report quarterly losses and report annual losses. And um, I think many of the uh, investors who were more specialized investors realized that the valuations that these companies had when they invested were just ridiculous. They just didn't make any sense and companies were losing tens or hundreds of millions of dollars every year. And there was, a, there was an aggressive pullback and revaluation. And that also was timed with the whole vape crisis in the United States with Juul and people dying and really it was very, very difficult to raise money in the fall publicly. And you know that's continued until today and it's been exacerbated by COVID. Um, even harder to raise money. And I would say that we, over the last four to six months, have not been involved that I can think of in any public raising of money. Although a number of our clients have been able to raise money privately still, because still if you have the right product and you have the right investors, you can do it. Um, but certainly uh, the shine is off the public market and we're seeing more and more companies um, in default of the regulations, uh, either the ones that are cross-listed on NASDAQ and the ones that are listed here on the Toronto Stock Exchange. They're not filing their financials, even though they all got extensions to do it. Some of them are being delisted. Some of them are in bankruptcy. Um, it'll be a really interesting M&A year this year and next year, I think. Um, why don't we go to the next slide? Um, so this is just a slide, a little bit about future products. So um, similar to the States, I believe, you know, dried cannabis still makes up the majority of the market. Um, that being said, edibles is a huge area in the market and a growing area in the market, just like it is in the United States. Bear in mind that edibles became legal in October, 2019, yet you couldn't get any on the shelf before December in the earliest, but really I think it ended up being January. So January of this, of this year is the first time you could really legally buy edibles. So there's not a ton of data on it, but we do know that in that first month, they did $4.4 million of sales in edibles, um, which was mostly from vapes and other edibles. The edible offering was very limited to really chocolate, gummies, um, and vape products, which, which became very, very popular. Um, some of the products that, are, that we're seeing coming to the market now are, are really interesting. And I think they have you know, some great opportunities. There's different inhalation um, uh, products that you can buy. There's, there's subdermal patches you can put on your arm. Um, but some of the really interesting things are we've seen now there's a company that has a powder. Um, so they've taken the dissolute, which is an oil, and they've turned it into a powder and the powder is activated so you can sprinkle it on anything. It dissolves in water. Um, very interesting product. Uh, beverages are getting out there in the market now more and more. Um, I see teas all the time. Um, so it's a pretty exciting part of the market and uh, it's a growing area of the market. Um, why don't we move on to the next slide? Um, future trends, there's, there's a whole bunch of future trends across the states and in Canada. One that I thought we talked about a little bit are just cannabis lounges. Um, right now, they're not allowed here. Um, there's been a lot of discussions at different provincial levels and different task force trying to tackle it. 
because um, there's certainly a desire for cannabis consumers to be able to consume um, in a place with other cannabis consumers. You know, I can tell you that in Ontario, um, the task force that was dealing with this um, considered all of the pros and they ultimately decided to pass on it for the time being, mostly because of these two reasons, as I understand it. Reason one is, you know, an edible you can have anywhere. There's no restrictions as to where you can have an edible. Obviously, you, shouldn't, you can't be driving a motor vehicle, um, but you can have an edible. So if you wanted to go to a bar and have an edible, you could have an edible and nothing stops you from doing that. Um, and the other issue really was a liability issue. Just like the states, um, owners of establishments that are serving people alcohol have liability if they serve somebody intoxicated and they get into an accident. You know, as probably many of you know, it's very tricky with cannabis. It's not, it's not as clear with alcohol where it's a straight line in and a straight line out based upon how much you consume and how much you weigh. Um, cannabis really doesn't work that way. Um, it could affect a very large person as quickly or quicker than a small person who uses it often. And there's no rule of thumb as to when it's really out of your system. It certainly can be in your hair and your bloodstream and in your urine for a very long time. Um, so there's a lot of risk there. And I think at the end of the day, they decided that it just wasn't something that Ontario was prepared to do now, but it, they're certainly talking about it in other provinces. And I suspect um, some version of it will be allowed. And they're certainly talking about allowing um, special permits for festivals and other concerts that will allow the consumption there, but you won't be able to sell it or buy it there. Um, why don't we go to the next page? So, oh, sorry, the next page is from a different slide that I have, my apologies. So the last part really that we wanted to talk about was exports and imports, because that's of interest to everyone internationally. Um, I can tell you that Canada became a really big exporter in the last few years. It's been servicing the, rec the, le the medical market um, in, other, in other countries where it's not as developed, where they don't actually, where they're not able to grow enough domestically. And one of the biggest places is Germany, but it goes to many other states as well. And a lot of our licensed producers have entered into huge multi-million dollar supply contracts where most of what they grow, they're selling, um, they're exporting to a foreign country. Um, you can get an import license. Uh, well, it's a permit, you can get an import or export permit. Um, but you have to apply for that separately and there's certain criteria, but they're certainly possible. The things that you can import into Canada um, are starting materials, seeds and plants, if you're a new license holder. Um, exporting, uh, it's pretty wide open as long as it's legal in the other jurisdiction and they get an import license from that jurisdiction. We've had great success doing that. Um, importing into Canada is tricky. Um, because you're really only allowed to do it for scientific purposes, which includes research and testing. So although we've spoken to many clients who are interested in bringing CBD and other products into Canada, it is quite tricky. And it's tricky to bring it into Canada and get it into the rec market because it's, it's generally only allowed for scientific and research and testing. So as a result of that, um, we've had a number of mandates both in the States and in Europe where we've looked at it and there are ways to do it, but it certainly is challenging, um, but it's, it's something to think about and an opportunity. Um, I think that really goes through the majority of our presentation. So I'll turn it over to you guys and open it up to any questions that you may have. Obviously we couldn't cover everything, but hopefully that gives you a pretty good overview. Any questions? If we have no questions, Matt, do you want to add anything? Um, yeah, no, it's, it's um, you know, look, it's hard. We're, you know, arguably the most advanced in terms of our cannabis, um, our legal cannabis market. Um, no offense to Uruguay and perhaps California. Um, but you know, there's been a lot happening, and I think for um, people that are practicing or living in jurisdictions where it's still developing, um, including the United States, because there's a whole federal piece of this that's going to need to come into play, which will require a ton of work. Um, but especially, you know, I think 
everyone can agree we're seeing sort of a, a cascading wave across the globe of starts with medical, moves to recreational. You're seeing things happen in the UK, you're seeing it in Asia, in South America. Um, and it's an exciting practice area um, because once that starts to occur, it's just one thing after another, um, often in an unpredictable fashion. You would, we've had a number of discussions where we, you know, we'd say, well, um, edibles are going to be legal at the end of this year. That's probably going to be a big area. Um, and it, in a way it is, but at the same time, um, a lot of the producers have their own in-house people to deal with certain regulatory issues. Um, so we don't get as many phone calls, but on the other hand, we'll be inundated with calls about something completely different that we just didn't see coming. Um, whereas you look back and you say, okay, I could kind of see that that was going to come, but certainly not in the way that we envisioned it. So, um, we've definitely found it to be a very diverse, um, and changing practice area, which is, um, I think, I certainly Andrew, Vlad, and myself find it exciting because things are always changing. The nature of the work's always changing. The nature of the clients are always changing. Um, and so, you know, we're still, what are we, two years in now, more so, but, you know, from the, from the radical, uh, uh, recreational legal regime two years in, and it's still ongoing. So, you know, I'm in a way jealous of people who are practicing in jurisdictions that are a little um, behind chronologically because there's just so much um, that's going to come. There's so many different areas of work and I'm sure John is in, uh, you know, the same boat where it's, you know, there's corporate, there's regulatory, there's M&A, there's real estate, there's tax, there's international, there's, it just, it, it almost never ends. So it's a very exciting uh, both from a practice perspective and from an industry perspective, just to see how things continually evolve. You know, one example I'll give is that we've talked a lot about cannabis tourism and consumption lounges and how things are going to play out. And that was starting to pick up steam. You know, there was discussions uh, we presented at panels and discussions about hotel chains and hotel groups and hospitality industry. And then here comes COVID and, you know, that's that for the time being. Um, so, you know, you never know where things are going to go and where they're going to twist and turn, but, um, definitely exciting practice area. And like I said, I'm uh, somewhat jealous, uh, of a variety of different, uh, jurisdictional areas because, you know, not only do they have this exciting wave of, of, um, legal work to come, but, you know, if you're in Colombia or Mexico, you also have that beautiful weather and all those other things. So I'm jealous for those reasons as well. And one other thing I'll, I'll just add that's been, you know, exciting in Canada is seeing um, big alcohol companies and big tobacco companies taking positions in large public um, cannabis companies. And they're doing that, you know, in part as a hedge, because what you're seeing in states where you have rec and you have medical is that you're seeing alcohol consumption is going down um, and, and cannabis use is going up. And, and the same thing with cigarettes. So you're seeing many of these companies invest huge amounts of money into these, into these companies, and it's exciting um, to see what sort of products they're going to come out with. In Canada, you can't mix cannabis and alcohol in a product, so there's no can of beer yet, but uh, probably will be at some point not too far away. Yeah, I think that's, that's a good point. And the other, I would add that um, it's, it's fascinating to watch as um, a citizen, you know, of Canada because, um, you know, we go into the office and uh, I'm sure Vlad and Andrew have had this, you know, I'll go into the office last year and our colleagues who don't practice cannabis law at all will say, um, well, it's really, cannabis really going downhill, right? And it's like, well, no, the public markets aren't so good and the cultivators are having a tough go of it, but people don't appreciate there's tech, there's real estate, there's retail, there's products, there's service companies. <clears throat> and you know, um, cannabis has been booming in terms of, you know, both the industry and in terms of the legal work since March when everything got shut down here because those stores are still open. So, it, you know, it's kind of funny. You look at your colleagues in the office or on a Zoom call and it's like, well, you're not so busy anymore. But, you know, like it, the whole cannabis is really having a tough go. And now they look at us and say, well, I guess that's not so much the case. And, you know, for us, that's no surprise because there's a lot of work. So um, 
I think people that are, you know, John's in it would probably uh, perhaps agree that there's a lot more to it than people think. And uh, that's the other exciting thing about the practice is if you're, especially if you're just getting into it or your jurisdiction's just getting into it, um, you think it's one kind of one thing, but it turns out to be a whole different set of things in a, in a very good way, in a very diverse way, and in a very evolving way. And the last thing I would sort of add is we see that as a citizen or citizens where um, attitudes towards cannabis definitely changes um, as time goes on. You know, I've got family members who cannabis is the devil. It's this is a horrible thing. We never should have legalized this. Um, and guess what? Well, now they're all taking gel caps at night because they've got neck pain, chronic neck pain. They can't sleep. They take one of these. They're out. It's the greatest thing. You know, my this is amazing. And I say, well, let me get their video recording from last Christmas yeah. where you're, you know, espousing all the negative things. But um, it's constantly developing and it's still very early, even in Canada, although we're further much along. And I think the runway and John's actually probably sees this very well in places like Colorado and California and Oregon, where, you know, the pricing of products changes, the consumer preference changes, the nature of the consumer changes over time. And we actually look to, you know, we're far along ahead, but we often look to what happened in those states because they're further along on a state level than we are. And so it doesn't take a, you know, prices are falling, there's oversupply. And we say, well, anyone that looked at anything that happened in Oregon or Colorado or California could have seen that coming like, you know, a year away, easy. And it's a great point, uh, Matt. And to your point and what you were saying, Andrew, about other more established industries trying to get involved, um, there's a lot of speculation that hemp will essentially become the next tobacco in the United States. You know, all the farmers who are growing tobacco with tobacco use declining need to have something to replace it with. And that could very well be hemp and, and other similar products. And we get inquiries all the time about people wanting to establish you know, tourism businesses and, and trips to states where um, there's less of a stigma about using these products, Colorado, Oregon, as you say. Um, so it, it's a field that taps into many different parts of our practice and, and keeps a lot of people busy. Right. Well, I think we're right at the hour. So um, Jonathan, Andrew, Vlad, Matt, thank you so much for your time today. I think this was very interesting. And I know we, when you mentioned in the beginning, we had several members from Asia Pacific register, um, probably so that they could get the recording and we'll make sure that we um, get a summary in the recording. If you guys could send me your presentations, I can include those as well. Um, and we'll get it out to any of the members who couldn't attend today who, um, we're interested. So that sounds great. Thank you all so much. Thank Appreciate you very it. much. Have a Thank great you. day. Bye. Take care. Bye bye.